Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's a long time from one Sabbath to another. And as we uh, mentioned in the prayer, we, we, we find ourselves becoming so busy, um, busy doing this and believing that this is essential and we have to get this done. And we get caught up in this round of activity and the very thing that we need to sustain us to endure, we tend to not get it. We open our Bibles and we even pray, but we often pray with that anxious spirit. We often pray with this, um, while we're praying, it's like everything, our ears catching every other sound. Maybe it's the chatter from the children or the chatter of the, the telephone. Um, and uh, the mind is spinning with, I have to do this and I have to get this before this time and all of these things. And so while we are praying, um, we're, 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 we're losing out on that reassuring presence of Christ. And we have prayed, we have read our Bibles, but we have not experienced that saving grace. We have not breathed that atmosphere of grace. Um, and we find ourselves throughout the day um, leaning to our own understanding, not acknowledging his ways. And, and often the end of the week finds us bruised and uh, well nigh beat down. And like the man at the pool of Bethesda, we're looking for someone to come and sort of put us in to an experience. We're looking for someone to come and stir up the waters so that we could jump in and uh, be healed. And not knowing uh, Jesus is leaning over us, asking us, would we be made whole? And so brothers and sisters, again, by God's grace, we don't want to just read the Bible see the promises, recite them, and not understanding what the experience is that led to the proclamation of such a statement. You know, when I think of Lamentations, Lamentations, the third chapter, it's after the book of Jeremiah, and we know that uh, Jeremiah, that weeping prophet, these lamentations as he was lamenting the condition of God's people. Lamentations. Uh, Jeremiah gave though, all those wonderful prophecies, but he was lamenting the condition of of the people of God. Jeremiah said, Oh, that my eyes was a fountain of water as he would weep day and night for the condition of the people of God. And brothers and sisters, we must understand that there's a condition that is an indication that God is melting away the dross of self while proclaiming the nearness of the events. And there were many who spoke about the nearness of the events. I, again, we talked about that uh, destruction of Jerusalem, the various signs and the various things that, that indicated that something was about to happen. Strange things were happening in Jerusalem during the time of the destruction or leading up to the destruction. And we read that there was a man that went about the city for seven years preaching something was about to take place. And brothers and sisters, we are told that that very man lost his life in the siege that he predicted. But when we consider that siege, and when we consider his time frame, and when we consider Paul 
and that epistle to the Hebrews leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, there was a spirit that attended that book as Paul was pleading with the people of God to relinquish their hold on earthly things and grab hold of he who was better than all their services, and that was Jesus. When you look at Joel, and when Joel saw the events, what did he call the people of God to do? He called them to weep between the porch and the altar and ask God to spare, plead with God for God's mercy. What did Moses do when he saw that God's people were about to be cut off, when he saw and knew what they had engaged themselves in? There was a desire to plead with the people of God. Brothers and sisters, when we are truly, when we truly can recognize where we are in the stream of time and the condition of the people of God as a whole, our own condition, it will lead us to an attitude where we will begin to pray as we are counseled in the book Evangelism, to pray that God would hold the winds. When we see what is actually coming, it will actually lead us to weep. When God would unfold the prophecies to the patriarchs and the prophets, you look at Abraham, when God says, How, shall I hide this thing from Abraham? This thing that I'm about to do, seeing that he's about to be a great and mighty nation. And as, and as the angel, as Christ unfolded to Abraham, the conditions that was to fall upon the cities. Abraham did not say, I'm, I'm grateful that I got me a country home. I'm grateful that I'm out of the cities. But what was the attitude of Abraham? He began to weep, as it were, between the porch and the altar. He pleaded with God to spare his people. We are told in Ezekiel chapter 9, volume 5, under the chapter of the seal of God, that there is to be a the wording, there is to be um, a sighing and a crying against the, for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Yes, we, we're, we're familiar with the crying aloud and sparing not, but the sighing, the weeping, the pleading, the crying for the abominations, not necessarily uh, uh, just mentioning the abominations, but a crying, seeing the condition of the people of God, seeing that they are not ready for that which in God's justice will come against the people of God because of their apostasy, but yet seeing the condition of the people, seeing uh, 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 Haziel, how he has brought a scourge upon the ministry, how church after church is in a condition where they're not hearing the Word of God. These churches, brothers and sisters, that throughout the land, you can drive from one state to another. You can go from north to south and will be hard pressed to find a church on Sabbath that is actually feeding the people of God, that is actually preparing them to, to not just to meet Jesus, but preparing them to cooperate with Christ in going out and saving the lost. You will be hard pressed to find a church on Sabbath that is actually arousing the people of God to a sense of duty. And yet with this in mind, 
rather than pleading and crying and, and, and wrestling with God to wake his people up. It is as if we're sitting and we're just, hey, as long as people don't have a place to go to church, let them bring their donations to me. Let them send their donations over here. Let them support what I'm doing. Let me spend my hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars and let me, let me build up a center where the people can send their monies rather than praying for the Spirit of God to awaken the people to a sense of their need and that God can, can, can move in these various congregations where the people are. But brothers and sisters, there's a spirit of selfishness. There's a spirit of rebellion. And this spirit of rebellion is not just those who are dancing and, and prancing up and down. This is not just talking about priest teams and women's ordination. Brothers and sisters, there are many who profess to be standing on the pillars of truth, and yet there's a spirit of selfishness that is seen in the ministry. There's a spirit of, let me get as much as I can for myself, and, and I'll prepare for the people of, for, for the coming of Christ, and those who are not willing to prepare, I'll just leave them be. But as we understand, brothers and sisters, this book of Lamentation, as despite the weeping and despite the condition that the people of God was in, there was something that uh, 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 Jeremiah still was hanging on to. And the Bible tells us here in the book of Lamentations, I want you to go there with me if you're not already there, Lamentations, the third chapter. Lamentations, chapter three. And again, this book is about Jeremiah weeping for the condition of the people of God. Jeremiah knew they were going to go into Babylon. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah was still preaching under the first and second siege of Babylon. He saw Babylon come and, and break down the walls. He saw the slaughter and the destruction that fell the first time Nebuchadnezzar came and brought this slaughter against the people of God. Jeremiah prophesied under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Babylon was going to come and destroy this city in light of all of the promises that were given that Jerusalem was to stand forever. And Jeremiah lifted up his voice because he was moved by the Spirit of God. Why? Not because Jeremiah, uh, uh, that the Spirit of God caused Jeremiah to preach against what was preached by Moses, that Jerusalem was to stand forever. Jeremiah even said in Jeremiah 25, 17, verse 25, that Jerusalem was to stand forever. But one thing that Jeremiah understood is that these proclamations were conditional, conditional upon obedience. The same thing is with us today, brothers and sisters. These promises are conditional of obedience. If the conditions are met, then the promise can be realized. But while we avoid, while we void out the conditions, we believe that God's promises to us as a people in these last days is, is, is arbitrary and God is going to do it regardless of how we continue to behave. And it's because of that mindset that has led to that selfish spirit. It is because we are unwilling to recognize that the promises given to this church through the prophet Ellen White are conditional based upon us living up to the promises that God has given. And because we are unwilling to recognize that, it has led to a spirit of selfishness. It has led to a spirit of, 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 of this, this only concern with what I am trying to get done. I am not concerned 
about the greater majority of the people who are having to get up Sabbath morning and have to grudgingly go into an environment where they're not being fed. And brothers and sisters, we can tell them to stay home till they're blue in the face, but staying home by itself will never solve the problem. Staying home and watching live stream will not fix the problem. Brothers and sisters, we need, God needs, God needs ministers, those who will stand in the gap. And yes, we can go out and we can, by the grace of God, we can do our best to raise up these, 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 these ministers and we ought to be doing it because it is a part of God's plan. But brothers and sisters, we can pray that God would turn the hearts of Aaron's for the glory of his cause. It was Aaron, brothers and sisters, that led the people of God in Exodus 32 into a great apostasy, which caused the loss of thousands of lives because of Aaron's inability to stand upon the word of God. And he went along with church policy over principle. And it was Aaron who led into this apostasy. But brothers and sisters, we are told in the book of Deuteronomy that Moses said that had he not prayed for Aaron, God would have destroyed Aaron too. But he prayed. He knew that Aaron led the people in apostasy. When, when Moses came down, he asked Aaron, what did you do? But he prayed that God would spare. And Aaron became someone who was recognized by God. In the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, when they wanted to uproot the ministry of Aaron, God testified and showed that he held on and supported the ministry of Aaron. Why? Because of his repentance, his conversion. And brothers and sisters, what if we had that same spirit? We are told in early writings, page 120, that if one saint were right, he could move the arm of God while a multitude, if they were wrong, would be weak and could affect nothing. What if we started praying that God would, could move upon the hearts of these individuals, that they would see where they have deviated from the truth of God? What if we began to pray and plead and weep between the porch and the altar? What if, brothers and sisters, God and prayed for these ministers and elders that they would see their great need and change? It doesn't mean that we should stop trying to build up the ministry. It doesn't mean that we should stop trying to bring people in to, uh, to understand that God has a calling and a place on their lives. But we should continue to pray that God could move upon some of these individuals. Because brothers and sisters, as we, again, as we consider all of where we are right now, that these promises that God has given to us, they're conditional. They're conditional upon faith, obedience, which is worked by love. Faith and obedience will only come by love. And this is what God is trying to bring us back to that first love, that experience, that, 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 that condition that is born in the heart when the sinner is converted from the error of his ways. This is the condition that God is trying to give us. Many have not had this experience. Many have grown up in the church and have never tasted or felt the sweet influence of sins forgiven. Many growing up in the church have never felt the sweet influence to know that their sins have been forgiven. They have never experienced it because they've been taught brothers and sisters that church in and of itself, affiliation in and of itself is equivalent to salvation with God. And it's not the same. There are many in the church, who have never felt this sweet influence. They don't know what it's like to have and to know that their sins have been forgiven 
because they've never felt the need to confess. You remember I told you the story of a young lady down there at Oakwood College. They were doing a week of prayer and all of a sudden uh, I was there with Dwayne Dunkley and we were talking to this young lady and she said, you know, this was the first time after this week of prayer and the man and the young and the young brother, uh, uh, Christopher Bailey, as he, uh, uh, he was the religious vice that year. And for this week of prayer, rather than picking the theology majors, he went and picked random people that he saw had an experience with God, random people that he just, that he could, that he just knew that this person was trying to walk for Jesus. And he picked these random people. Of course, the theology majors were not uh, too excited that they were not chosen uh, to preach in this week of prayer. But brothers and sisters, that young lady says something that I'll never forget. And she said, you know, she says, this was the first time that I've ever left church and felt as if I had sins to confess. I actually went to my dorm and actually felt that I had a need to confess my sins. Brothers and sisters, how many 30, 40, 50 years old, 60 years old are sitting in church and have never heard a message that would make them feel the need to confess never felt the tugging of the Spirit of God in their heart. Oh yes, the Spirit was prayed for. Oh yes, uh, they went through the form and Lord send us thy Spirit, hide me behind the cross, let thy name in. Yeah, we, we, we go through the motions. We get on our knees and we preach sermons in our prayers as if God is impressed with all that. And yet how many have sat in churches and never felt the need to cry out, oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? There are many brothers and sisters who have never felt this experience. And these are the ones that we should be lamenting for. Not trying to get them in front of our live stream, but trying to get them connected with God's live stream. Put, putting them in a place where they can catch his signal and understand the need of a deeper experience, being willing to confess that they don't know Jesus, being willing to acknowledge that there's something greater that is needed in the life more than sermons, S where, they, where, where they can hear the gospel, brothers and sisters, that is not being preached as a lifeless theory, but as a living force to change the life. And they will only hear that when they hear from the lips of one who the gospel has changed. And you don't have to go to school of theology to do that. You don't have to watch these live streams to do that. You need to fall on your knees and plead for the spirit of God to transform your life. And like Jacob, brothers and sisters, your name can be changed. You don't have to leave your closet the way you entered into it. And oh, brothers and sisters, you can wrestle with Christ and let him touch the hollow of your thigh. And for the rest of your life, you will have to lean upon that staff of God. This is what God wants to do for us. But let's look here in Lamentations, Lamentations chapter three. Notice brothers and sisters, this is Jeremiah weeping for the people of God, knowing that banishment and captivity is, is imminent and the complete destruction of the work is about to take place. Notice what it says in Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter three. And in the midst of all this, Notice what Jeremiah can say. Jeremiah, Lamentations 3, verse 20, the Bible says, Jeremiah says, um, my soul hath them still in remembrance. He's speaking of, matter of fact, jump back, jump back, jump back. Oh man, there's so much here. Um, verse 19, it says, remembering, Jeremiah says, uh, you know what? I'm going to jump back to verse 17. 
and thou hast removed my soul far off from peace, he says. I forget prosperity, and I said my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I call, recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It is of the what? Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new how often? Every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that do what? Wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He says, um, jump down, jump down. Uh, matter of fact, I'll keep reading. I'll keep reading. No, no, no. Jump. Go back. Go back. Verse 28. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so, be there. If so, be there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever. It says, But thou, but thou, he calls grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. And brothers and sisters, you can continue to read it. You can read through the entire book of Lamentation. It is only four, five chapters. But as you go through it, you're going to, you're going to sense the burden upon Jeremiah's heart. Jeremiah prophesied. He saw these things coming. Jeremiah could have went into a retirement of ease, but he wept for the condition of God's people. His heart was burdened for them. Why? Because Jeremiah did not just preach to the people. He came close to the people. He was there with them, brothers and sisters. He did not withdraw from their society. He did not say, come not near me. I'm holier than thou. He sat alone because he wouldn't sit in the assembly of the mockers. But he was not unmindful that the people needed to hear a word from God. Because brothers and sisters, I want us to understand one thing, that as these situations come upon the people of God, you and I, no matter where we live, we can find the most country retreat known to mankind. And brothers and sisters, these things will come nigh us. They're going to come nigh. Said so yes, the Bible says in Psalms 91, they won't come nigh unto our lane. Oh, brothers and sisters, when we understand what God has prepared for his people. And yes, we realize that God will take us through these trials, but this, these, this anguish, this, this, this destruction shall not enter into the souls of men who put in their trust in him. All their earthly possessions will be taken, but they will have a sense of peace that passeth understanding. And these things will not come nigh their dwelling. These things will not be able to disturb their peace. Job passed through this trying hour. It was uh, uh, Elijah. He said, there shall be neither rain nor dew these three years. And let, at the word of my mouth, the Bible says that Elijah prayed and God heard his prayer and the rain stopped. And he prayed again, and then the rain came. And so, brothers and sisters, but eventually, what happened to Elijah? The brook dried up where he was. And so the brooks that we see that will dry up for the masses will also dry up for us. 
God wants to do something for us. God wants to give us a greater and deeper experience than we have yet had. And brothers and sisters, I pray that you would be encouraged, that you would seek to understand and draw nigh to Christ, that you would pick up his word. And as I always say, we don't want to feel as though we need to uh, uh, start back uh, where we left off, but we have to, we want to be able to, we have to come to a point where we have to acknowledge our weakness. We have to confess our frailties and confess that independent spirit, that self-sufficient spirit, and ask God to give us grace and power and that we would learn how, learn how to depend upon Jesus. Learn how, as we study the Word of God, you are learning how. God will put you in practical uh, uh, situations, in real time situations where you will have to learn how to depend on Jesus. And when these situations come, that God will give us an eye quick to understand and to discern that this is his providence and that we should wait patiently on the Lord. Learn to be still and wait upon God. This is a, this is a learning experience. It's not something you could pray upon yourself. It's something that you learn as you learn to trust in Christ. It's not, Lord, we pray once, um, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own son, oh, and we quote it. We can even sing it. There's a song, beautiful scripture song, but we have to learn how to depend upon Jesus. Learn how to trust in him. So as we pick up Genesis, and as we start reading through our Bibles, we get and we see Eve standing at the tree and we begin to wonder almost, almost in scorn. Why is she there? Why is she doing that? Didn't she hear what God said? And we can, and, and we have this scorn for Eve and for Adam as if we would not have done what they did. And then we find ourselves closing our Bibles, finding all these object lessons on why they should have listened and why they should have obeyed and, 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 and what God did to restore them. And then we find ourselves later on at our own tree, plucking its fruit. And while we're sitting there, brothers and sisters, as it were, eating from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, the Spirit of God comes back to us and begins to bring that scene back to our minds. And he takes the thing that we're dealing with, and now he brings us back to the garden, and he puts that thing in the garden, and there we see, like Eve and Adam, eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when we begin to see this experience, then we can humble ourselves and realize that they are, we are no different. And then with great humility, we realize that God has a covering for us, that God wants to restore us. And then we have to, then will we be willing to come as it were from that hiding place and let God cover us upon our confession and our acknowledging of our sins. It's easy to look throughout the scriptures and see the Pharisees and the Sadducees barking at Christ, hindering his work. And yet we fail to look at our day and see how we have are hindering the work of salvation that God is trying to carry out in our individual lives. Man, look at these Pharisees. Look at what they're doing to destroy the work. Look at what they're doing to... To, to frustrate the work of the gospel, and we don't see how we are casting stumbling blocks before our face, before our children, before our spouses, before our friends and our neighbors, and they have a skewed view of who Jesus is. And then, but as we begin to realize these things through prayer, 
through study and we allow the Spirit of God to speak to us and we carry God with us, then we can begin to see, Lord, I am no different than the Pharisees. My righteousness, Lord, will you have to tell my children, accept their righteousness, exceed the righteousness of your parents, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Will God have to look at us as parents and in order to save our children, will have to do for them as he did for Joseph because God could not trust Joseph in the house of an, in a Christian home to be, to, 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 to assist with the plans and the vision and the mission that God had for Joseph. And so God had to separate him from his Christian home in order to preserve the vision that God and plans that God had for this young man. How many Josephs have God had to separate from their homes in order to save the mission that he had for them? How many brothers and sisters? But if we read the word of God with a prayerful, teachable spirit, then we begin to allow the spirit of God to speak to us. And so we will see in all of these various stories, lessons for then and for us. Lord, where am I in this story of Adam and Eve? Where am I in this story of Cain and Abel? We like to see ourselves as Abel, but often we don't see the spirit of Cain lives in many of us. Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to hold you long. I want to close. There was something we were reading today in worship and it stood out. And yet it was one of these things that it was one of these things that makes you wonder. Not wonder, wrong word is one of those things that you have to experience to know the truth of the statement. Is an, it an, it's a statement that is made and it is made with an emphatic truth that it is real as the air we breathe. It is a matter of fact. Yet, if we don't see it for ourselves, we will never be able to encourage others of its truthfulness. What I mean by that. Something can be true as the sun is in the sky. And yet, if we don't experience, we can never impart that hopefulness that the seeker himself will find it. Now, they can look beyond us and find hope. But God has put us in the path of individuals that we might be able to impart that hope that this statement is true. Now watch what I mean by that. It's on page 21. It's taken from the book Education. The chapter is the Eden School. And this is a, this is a, a, a man, it was beautiful as we read it, but I just said, wow, we have to go and see whether or not it's true. And this is the statement. It says, the book of nature which spreads its living lessons before them, afforded an example ex and afforded an exhaustless source of instruction and delight. Now watch this. Here's a statement. On every leaf of the forest. How many leaves? Every leaf of the floor forest and stone of the mountains in every shining star, in earth and sea and sky, God's name was written. Now, brothers and sisters, every leaf, stone of the mountain, it says, uh, 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 earth, sea, sky, God's name is written. Everywhere we turn, God's name is written. Now, keep in mind that because sin has entered in, 
there is a seemingly blur upon nature. And we have to go to the Word of God to get a clear revelation of Himself. However, sin has not completely obliterated the character of God. Praise the Lord. So then, that means that you and I can still look at every leaf and find God's name written. Every stone of the mountain, every shining star, earth, sea, and sky, God's name is there. David said it, Psalms 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. So we can still look in nature and find God's name written. Now, emphatic statement, we say, praise God, amen. The question is, can you pick up a leaf? Can you pick up a leaf and show someone the character of God like Jesus did? Consider the lilies, how th these were lessons. He saw the character of God stamped upon every leaf. He can say, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 it's like a grain of a mustard seed. He knew, he saw God written there. And all these th lessons of life, humanity, though marred by sin, he still saw something in man that was worth saving. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins. He still saw something in humanity that can bear the image of God. And so, brothers and sisters, God wants to anoint our eyes with eye salve that we might be able to see him everywhere, that we would find hope in humanity. Our hope is not in them, but we find that there is something in humanity worth saving. Then we can cooperate with God in the saving of humanity. Brothers and sisters, God is longing to do something in the heart of man. He's longing to do something in your heart and in mine. The question is, the Bible says God will work who will let it. Will we let God work in us? Will we allow God to do in us that we might cooperate with him in the salvation of mankind. We can see that we're living at the end of time. We can see that we're on the verge of a stupendous crisis. We can look around in the news and we can see it. We can hear it everywhere. But that manifestation of the sons of God is what God is longing for. That's what God is looking for. Someone that he can work through that will speak life into their brothers and sisters that can see people possessed of demons and can speak life into them. That cashier, that mailman, that, that, that person walking aimlessly down the street, that we can speak life into these individuals. This is what God wants to do for us. And brothers and sisters, why not us? Why not now? 